I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists for this evening. Each of our panelists will be given approximately seven minutes. I don't have anything to ring you off, so don't worry. Um, to discuss our topic of failure of access. We will then have a moderator for discussion and questions from the audience. I would like to mention that we are also recording this event and we'll send out a link to the video uh, once it's made available through our repositories at SFU and UBC. Again, for those of you who are tweeting, like me, epically tweeting right now, um, our hashtag is OpenEducationWK. So without further ado, I will welcome our panelists and introduce them. Tara Robertson is access uh, an accessibility librarian at Caper BC. I must say I really love your bio. Uh, Tara is a librarian who doesn't work in a library. She likes figuring out how things work, why they break, and how to make them work better. She's passionate about universal design, intellectual freedom, feminism, all things open, and flu vog shoes. <laughs> Next, we have Christina Hendricks, professor um, at the University of British Columbia. She's a professor of teaching in philosophy at UBC. She's also a part of the Open Pack team of faculty, students, um, and librarians at UBC who practice and advocate for open education through facilitating workshops and maintaining a website about open education at UBC, which is a plug open.ubc.ca. Uh, she was a faculty, sorry. She was a faculty fellow with uh, BC Campus Open Textbooks program in 2014 and 2015, and an Open Educational Resource Research Fellow with the Open Education Group from 2015 to 2017. And next we have Jenna Massey, who is a Strategic Support Advisor and v uh, VP Students Office at UBC. She's been involved in advocacy efforts around OER and open textbooks since the spring of 2015 when she served as VP Academic and University Affairs for UBC Student Society, the Alma Mater Society. Through her time in that position, she worked with counterparts at other student societies and with UBC to bring awareness of OERs to students and help to facilitate more adoptions and creation of open content at the university. This advocacy culminated in an OER student toolkit supported by BC Campus, which acts as a roadmap for student groups to get involved in OER advocacy. Jenna currently works as a strategic support advisor for the VP Students Office at UBC and has continued to be an advocate for OER. And last but not least, uh, we have Juan Pablo Alperin who is an assistant professor at the Canadian Institute for Studies in Publishing and the Associate Faculty Director of Research with the Public Knowledge Pro Project at Simon Fraser University. He believes that research, especially when it is made freely available, as so much of today's work is, has a potential to make meaningful and direct contributions to society, and that it is our responsibility as the creators of this research to ensure we understand the mechanisms, networks, and mediums through which our work is discussed and used. Beautifully written. So uh, please help me <laughs> welcome our panelists. And uh, we have one more introduction here as well. We're also very lucky to uh, sorry, have with us here tonight uh, Brady, Brady Yano, who's the Assistant Director of Open Education with Spark and is going to be moderating our, our panel tonight. Um, a, little bit about, uh, a little bit about Brady. Um, he provides support and leads special projects across Spark's open education portfolio. His passion for open began during his time as a student leader right here at SFU. Recognizing textbook costs as a barrier to accessing a post-secondary education, he saw open textbooks as a solution. Um, from his position in student government, Brady organized a campaign, which I think will be familiar to many of you, called hashtag textbookbrokebc to raise awareness and expand support for OER adoptions on campus. Building on this success, he worked with student societies at other institutions and provinces to launch similar campaigns. Um, as the newest addition to the Spark team, Brady works to advance the impact and reach of Spark's open education program. This includes working with libraries to develop and expand OER programs, uh, developing new resources and uh, giving and moderating workshops and presentations, such as this one. <laughs> uh, his portfolio also includes support for communications, policy advocacy, and event planning. That's it. <laughs> Hi. 
Hi, I'm Tara. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this event. I'm a librarian and I've been working at Caper BC for five years. Hi, Joanne. <laughs> so, so Caper BC, if you don't know, um, we're an organization funded by the Ministry of Advanced Education and we're mandated to serve students with print disabilities at 20 post-secondary institutions in BC. So all the colleges and universities except for the big research ones. Um, we're hosted by Langara College. So we serve students who have a barrier to accessing print. Um, this includes students who are blind or visually impaired, students who have a learning disability and have difficulty reading print, um, students with physical disabilities where maybe they can't hold a book or they have chronic pain and can't carry their books across campus, or students maybe with a head injury who can't sit and focus their eyes. So we serve a lot of different kinds of students. Right now we serve about 1,200 students and 65% of those have learning disabilities. So I just wanna tell you a little bit about the disability accommodation process because as a librarian, I didn't know much about this before I started doing this work. So if you're a student with a disability, um, you need to register at your disability service office at your university. You, you need to bring medical documentation or a psych ed assessment, which costs about $2,000 to the university to show the documentation that you have a legit disability. The counselors then work with you to identify the barriers that you might experience in your classes and then put accommodations in place. So it's a reactive, retroactive kind of process that's for one individual only. So the whole reason, whoops, our department exists is to format shift textbooks. We chop and scan about 4,000 textbooks a year. And some of the work we do is interesting, like making complex math equations accessible or describing graphic novels, so describing both the text and the visual story that goes along. But some of our work is really kind of dull, and <laughs> I don't know why we have to do this work. Um, it's really frustrating to deal with course packs like this that are a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. Um, this is one of the worst ones we had in the last year, and even if you don't have a print disability, is this easy for anyone to read? <laughs> I just want to tell you about the two models of disability that are out there. Um, the first model is the medical model, and it's the older model, and it looks at individuals as having a medical condition. Um, the idea is that the body is like a machine that has to be fixed and brought in line with what's normal. So this is the, the model that we're working with, within with disability service offices. The social model of disability came about in the 80s, and I like this model a lot better. It looks at disabil disability as a mismatch between an individual and the environment. So physical, cognitive, and social exclusion is the result of mismatched interactions. So if we look at disability this way, there are design problems that can be solved. So a classroom handout with small font is disabling to a student with a visual impairment. Or a print, print textbook is disabling to a student with a print disability. Or stairs are disabling to a student in a wheelchair. They're the environmental or the decisions that we've made that go into learning that exclude people. So when I heard about the Open Textbook Project, um, I saw an opportunity for us to insert ourselves sort of at the beginning of the textbook creation process. Instead of retrofitting and fixing things that were broken, we could work with textbook authors at the beginning of the process to foster a sense of empathy about the different kinds of students who would be reading the books and fix things at the beginning so that we wouldn't have to at the end. I worked with Amanda Coolidge at BC Campus and Sue Donner, an amazing instructional designer at Camosun College, and a group of six students with visual impairments to test some of the open textbooks that BC Campus made. And it was really interesting because I don't get to see the students access the formats that we create. It was really cool to see how they were accessing these books with the assistive technology that they used every day. So I'm gonna try and hit play. can't do it. In this case, the angle of the screen 
and where the computer is is disabling for me. <laughs> so what this shows, it's a, a video of a student using Zoom text. Um, she's a PhD candidate at UBC. And with Zoom text, you can change the, the color scheme. You can invert the colors. You can make the mouse pointer like crosshairs. And you can increase the magnification. So this student increases the ma magnification eight times. And when we were looking at the English um, literature textbook, there were some old poems in there. And the process of scanning across to track horizontally to, to, to read the poem, it makes you sick. So it's really hard to absorb and understand and appreciate the content of the poem because the mechanics of reading is just so uncomfortable. So that's what you would have seen in the video. So we inverted the colors. We're changing the mouse. And now we're zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. And then even to navigate to the, to the correct poem, it's kind of like there's a, a left sidebar. OK, awesome. We got the poem. Now we're going over to read it. So just the mechanics of trying to read this poem in this open textbook is really laborious. And it's hard. Like, what's great about this poem? How does this link to the poem from last week? I don't know. Like, it, just reading it is painful. So when I heard what the student had to say in written form, I didn't really understand it. But when I saw what she saw on her computer, it made a lot of sense to me. Uh oh, now I have to find the mouse again. Ah, oh, there we go. So Sue, Amanda, and I put together the Accessibility Toolkit, which is actually an open textbook itself, um, as, a, as a guide for faculty who are writing open textbooks. So the first part of the textbook goes over two main concepts, universal design for learning. And we borrowed um, these user personas from um, a UX book, just to kind of give faculty ideas of the different kind of people who could be in their classrooms without reducing people to a disability. So instead of like the guy who is blind, it's Paul and he's 17, he lives with his parents, he's a total Mac nerd, his dream is to become a scientist at NASA and he's blind. So it gives you like a whole person and someone to think about when you're writing the content. And then the second part of the, the toolkit has how-tos, like how do I do an image description? How do I make tables accessible? What is the best practice for making video and audio accessible? So the idea is that people kind of get the, the overall ideas, we show them the how-tos, and then connect back to those personas. So for me, this was the first time I really worked in the open, and it was delightful and terrifying. <laughs> Um, Whitney Queensbury and Sarah Horton, the authors of Web for Everyone, let us adopt their user personas. And they also let us use their illustrations. Um, they open license them for us. And then one of the BC campus designers added on a couple of extra illustrations of user personas, sort of in the same style. So we were able to have eight really great illustrations by only drawing two. Um, our Ontario partner, Arrow, translated the toolkit into French, which they could do because it was open license. So it's now a resource that can be used across Canada. And the, in 2016, we won the Open Education Consortium's Creative Innovation Award for the toolkit. So for me, it was really exciting to work in the open and to kind of build from the strengths of colleagues I hadn't met yet. So when I met Sarah Horton at a technology conference, super exciting to meet her finally because we had all these really generous email interactions. And yeah, it felt like she was a colleague I knew, had known through working through this project. So I tried to find a CC by license image of a dumpster fire, and I couldn't find a good one. <laughs> so all you get is a dumpster. Um, maybe you're familiar with what happened at the beginning of the month at UC Berkeley. Um, they decided to withdraw 20,000 videos and lectures instead of captioning them. On the WebAIM site, which is an organization specializing in web accessibility, they write, they're pretty harsh. Considering that captioning requirements long predate this content, the videos themselves are three to 10 years old, this is disappointing. Other UC campuses have long had captioning efforts in place. 
The Berkeley created no plan to provide captions in a stepwise way is infuriating. It should not have required a Department of Justice finding for them to consider this. The response in making the content inaccessible to everyone is appalling. It has unfortunately resulted in an outcry against students with disabilities who simply, who simply seek equal access to their peers. And they finish by saying, Berkeley, America's number one public university, a pioneer in social justice, civil rights and disability rights, has little excuse for these careless decisions. So the US and Canada are a little different because the US has had federal disability legislation since 1990 and in Canada we don't. Ontario and Manitoba are the only provinces right now who have accessibility legislation and they're slightly different. <laughs> So last week when Robin DeRosa, um, an open education advocate was in town, I got to have coffee with her and Rosario and Lindsay Tripp from Langara College. And it was really awesome hanging out and talking with these smart women. And we were one of the things we were talking about was how accessibility versus access sometimes gets set up as a false dichotomy. So either we can have access for students with disabilities or we can have open content. And I, I think that's really a false dichotomy. And in this case, it's super disappointing that this is the, the way that UC Berkeley decided to go. There's so many other ways they could have done this. Um, Robin DeRosa suggested they look at the top accessed videos and decide to caption them or see who else was using them and do a partnership and caption them or do, do some kind of fancy crowdsourcing thing with technology and get interested citizens who are interested in that astrophysics lecture to caption it and create some kind of quality control workflow. There were other options other than Berkeley paying for it all or them moving behind a paywall. So that's kind of disappointing. So this is my last slide. And back to Robin DeRosa, in her blog post, textbooks, ugh, she writes, Fundamentally, I don't want to be part of a movement that's focused on replacing static, overpriced textbooks with static, free textbooks. Um, in her lectures in Vancouver last week, she said it's not about textbooks, it's about access to education. And Rajiv Jangiani, a psychology prof at KPU and senior open education advocacy and research fellow at BC Campus, in his 2015 keynote at the Open Textbook Summit, he said, Open education is a social justice issue. We need to be very aware about the messaging about who higher education is reserved for. If we don't think about accessibility, who are we saying belongs in higher education? And if our students can't afford the textbooks, who are we saying belongs here? So for me, it's not just about financial accessibility, but ac access for students with disabilities too. Thanks. Um, hello everyone. Um, as was stated, my name is Jenna O'Massey. Uh, I do have a very fanc fancy title, but I still am a student, so I am the, the wonderful student a part of this collective. Um, and I'm going to bring us down a little bit more. Um, as was mentioned, I've been working um, in the open space uh, since becoming a student leader at the Student Society at UBC, um, with affordability and accessibility really being an issue that students care about, that students called for, um, that was an expectation for uh, myself and my colleagues to be answering to. And so when we were thinking about access, we were not thinking about the sphere outside our institution. We were really thinking about the 50,000 students who we represented and worked with, um, and within our institution, the lack of accessibility um, and affordability that existed. Um, and so bringing that question of access down a little bit um, to the idea of cost and cost for the student. Um, and so if we think about the conversation surrounding um, open educational resources specifically, um, not even moving on to open pedagogy and open practice, um, the, the piece that really hooks students is price. Um, and so from this graphic, you can see, um, just looking at the open textbook project, and this is from uh, last year this time, um, from to, and their numbers from 2012 to 2014. Um, total student, student savings were um, 352 
1,353 and now has, has really exceeded that and even on our campus alone has, has looked close to this, um, open.ubc.ca, a little plug. Um, but going back to um, Textbook Broke BC um, that, that was already spoken about, um, the real caption and the real plug for students to be a part of this conversation surrounding open educational resources was the affordability and accessibility limitations that traditional textbooks offer. Um, it wasn't even going to that next step. Really hooking students was a conversation surrounding price. And so you'll see these are books marks that we made with our counterparts, um, Brady at the time, at uh, the Simon Fraser Student Society. Um, really bringing people into the conversation through talking about their needs and their perception about accessibility of textbooks. Now, um, the next two slides I'll be showing you data from the Academic Experience Survey, which is a survey run um, of students from across, UB, uh, undergraduate students from across UBC Vancouver by the Student Society, and these were questions we asked um, at the end of last year. And this then moves on to the next step. So, so price and cost and accessibility is a way to bring students into the conversation, but students are considerate of more than just that. Um, if you look at the first question specifically, 53% of students frequently or often um, bought a textbook or other course resource and didn't use it or rarely used it throughout the term. Um, beyond that, you then see going down this list that students also um, find very creative methods um, to forego buying the traditional textbook um, in the bookstore. Beyond that and reaching more into that academic need that students see for textbooks and, and the real relevance that they see for open educational resources. Um, if you look at the third question here, 51% um, of students somewhat or strongly disagree that when their professor assigns textbooks, the content of the whole book is relevant to the course. Um, and so beyond just it being difficult to buy the course textbook, Potentially you're buying a $300 textbook to use three chapters. And, and this really was a piece that I know you are all aware of, but that for students coming into the conversation um, was, was a huge grasp at um, gaining their attention in terms of mobilizing them to be a part of this movement. The other piece that sits behind the scenes and that was alluded to um, in our earlier um, discussion was the trickle down effect um, that happens or the other pieces that are involved in, um, in pushing out the open education, open educational resources and the open education agenda, should we say. Um, and at UBC, there's two tangible pieces um, that can be seen in that. Um, the first is that piece surrounding promotion and tenure. And so at UBC, the senior appointment committee guidelines, um, the um, guide to reappointment, promotion, and tenure procedures at UBC, um, has recently, after advocacy from students, um, added language surrounding um, the creation of open uh, materials as a part of academic leadership, which is one of the um, pieces to gaining um, reappointment, promotion, and tenure. And, and so thinking about how to embed um, this idea of open education and those pieces in what already exists at the institution and really in putting it within the hierarchy that already exists was a piece that students were very keenly aware was needed. Um, and the trickle down effect that, that that has and that continued advocacy surrounding that piece has to students may not be necessarily understood or seen by students, but ensures that there is more of a conversation surrounding um, open educational resources and more of an, uh, an ability to adapt, create, and adopt on the faculty side. On the other side, the Teaching, Learning and, uh, the Teaching and Learning Enhancement Fund at UBC is um, a fund that gives out millions of dollars a year to uh, flexible learning initiatives. Um, and recently, um, because of student advocacy as well, um, within this process, um, there is now a criteria that um, projects that are accepted um, by this pro process are expected to um, use open access, to create openly licensed materials, um, and to really see a benefit across the institution and have materials that are able to be used across the institution, not just own in their in their own silos. And so again, something that students might not actually see, but that truly affects their experience when their faculty members can now benefit from the funding that was received from another project in a discipline that maybe sits across the institution. 
And so I, th I think how I want to end is just talking about the learnings that um, Brady, myself, and uh, my counterpart Daniel at um, UBC as well um, found from um, bringing together the OER Student Toolkit with BC Campus. And that was, um, as was mentioned, a roadmap for students, um, student groups, uh, and student societies across specifically Canada, but anywhere, to really think about advocacy um, and support for open educational resources and to start their own movement on their campus. Um, and I think what we realized there was that though potentially the impact of um, or the the ability for open educational resources and open education to open up access across the world may be limited, but to the students who are already within our institutions and to the access of students who attend institutions and are already learners, um, open educational resources truly do offer um, both a huge uh, incentive for them to get involved in the conversation, but an opportunity for them to actually be able to succeed in their courses um, and succeed academically. And so though the question of access outside the boundaries of our academic walls um, is, is a good question because we don't know. Um, within is still a huge issue that we need to be thinking about. Um, and that by bringing students in through, through really discussing those, uh, those cost needs, you're then allowing them to become of that become a part of that academic conversation about further benefits to open educational resources that potentially are much more uh, visible to faculty members, um, to those working in this space, um, but are, are something that students really are imp impacted by. Thank you. Great, so thank you uh, for inviting me. I'm Christina Hendricks, I teach at the University of British Columbia and I have worked with Jenna um, for, well, last year, and then she went on to her, her current position. And I've, I'm also part of what we call an open pack at UBC, which is Jenna um, and her colleague Daniel Monroe, who I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, um, and now new students. So it's students, it's some faculty, it's uh, staff from our teaching and learning center, and it's a librarian. And all together, we, we actually have done a lot. But I have to say, I'm really glad I followed Jenna because Jenna described what the students were able to do that I don't think the faculty or the staff by ourselves or the librarians by ourselves would have been able to do. Those things that they managed to do, like getting the, the um, uh, pr promotion and tenure guidelines changed, the uh, teaching and learning grants changed, that's because the students made a noise. So, that's really where you have to go if you want to get things done. Okay, but um, like Jenna, I am also thinking about what else access does. If, if we're not really doing the thing that we had hoped perhaps with, with getting education out there beyond our institutions, I don't know, I don't have the data for sure about that, but I do know that there are interesting things going on inside the institutions. And I really appreciated your, your keynote today to talk about what else is going on in, in the rest of the world and how what we think we're providing in terms of access isn't really gonna be helpful if there's not even you know, uh, uh, electricity, right? But I'm gonna talk about things inside the institution. Um, and I think there's a lot of other things that access provides, but I don't know to what degree we're all taking advantage of it, myself included, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm gonna first talk about you know, the fact that you, you create an open educational resource, somebody creates an open educational resource, who else uses it? Well, faculty use it, right? And I was part of a, a team of people who were open textbook fellows with BC Campus a couple of years ago. And we did a research study of, um, it, it was in 2014 and 2015, there were 78 faculty in BC who filled out this survey, uh, most of whom who had experience using open educational resources. But here's what they said they used them for. Uh, yeah, okay, it's all coming up together. So they. It's not just necessarily that they will adapt it and put it into their course and do something different with it, although I think that's a really useful thing to do. They will also, and this is certainly how I use open educational resources too, just for ideas and inspiration in part, right? Oh, there's something really interesting that that person did. Maybe I should do that too, or that sparked something new in me. Supplement coursework. Um, I do this all the time. I, I assign things as optional. This is also on their, on their uh, optional self-study assign things as optional if they want, or I assign things as uh, required uh, uh, next to a textbook or something like that, that 
that I would not otherwise have been able to create myself. Prepare for teaching. I do this all the time. I teach philosophy, and I often teach things that I don't really know super well. Maybe I shouldn't <laughs> say that on the video. <laughs> but the fact is, um, you know, sometimes you're teaching things that just fits with the course, but you haven't taught it before, and you go out and you see somebody else's lecture notes, and that makes all the difference, right? So there's a lot of things that, that uh, access can provide for faculty members. Um, but I also, we also looked at whether the degree to which people are just using things or also adapting things. And this is one of those areas that I think that, that open uh, educational resources can provide options for that maybe we aren't all doing, myself included. Um, there were a lot more people who used open educational resources than adapted open educational resources and certainly than created open educational resources themselves. But the nice thing is if there is something out there, it not only allows you to use it, but you can change it to fit your context, right? And this is something that you know students might want with a textbook, for example. But not as many people are doing that. Maybe that's something to, to you know, get ourselves more into. Of course, part of the problem is, and we found this in our survey, um, it depends on what kind of OER you're using. So a lot of people, most of them were using videos. A number of them were using images. This requires a fair bit of work to engage in adaptation, right? If it's a text, that's not too hard. But um, the kinds of things that they're using are, are going to make a difference. Nevertheless, um, uh, there was somebody at BC campus, Amanda Coolidge, recently sent out an email asking about research on adaptation and you know, how much do we know of adaptation is going on and there isn't that much research out there. So that's something to look into. Um, one thing we did do on our survey is split these uh, uh, numbers out by type of institution. I'm sorry, the slide doesn't look that great. So use is still the highest, except for in research institutions. So we had research institutions, uh, SPTU stands for, uh, actually I can't remember what SP stands for, but it's a teaching focused institution, and then a community college. So um, Kwantlen Polytechnic, for example, would be in the, the teaching focused institution, UBC would be in the research institution. And we saw much more creation and adaptation in the research institutions than we did in the teaching focused or community college institutions. And I'm just, I'm guessing that is, uh, we didn't ask why. I'm guessing that is partly just a matter of uh, time, you know, the, the workload, that kind of thing, perhaps. But that's an area that I think we could do more in, perhaps. But that is going to require a fair bit to, to figure out how to encourage that. But it's not just faculty, of course. We also could have students using open educational resources. This is where I think the more interesting stuff perhaps is. Um, how could students take what's already out there and do something interesting with it or create their own? So some of you may have heard of this uh, idea, student as producer, which came out of um, the University of Lincoln in the UK. Um, where the, the whole model is thinking of, of students as creators of knowledge and as creators of curriculum in addition to creators of, of things that might go outside the university, they also help to create educational resources for each other. Um, along with that, similar but a slightly different idea is non-disposable assignments, which comes from David Wiley. Sometimes uh, in later blog posts, he also called them renewable assignments. So, a non-disposable, a, a disposable assignment is one that the student spends several hours creating, the teacher reads, makes some comments, gives it back to the student, the student throws it away. Right? So it's disposable. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't add anything to the world. So a non-disposable assignment is one that um, the student creates work, but it actually has some value beyond the course. It's not just for a grade. right? So I want to talk about these kinds of things where the students are producing knowledge, they're producing resources for others to use educationally, and also these are non-disposable. These are things that can be um, used by others, but also if they put an open license on them, they can be reused by others. So they take something with an open license, they do something with it, they put an open license on it again, it gets reused. That's why it's renewable. Right? Here are some simple examples. Um, you've probably heard of people doing Wikipedia assignments. We've, uh, we've got a number of people at the University of British Columbia who are doing various levels of Wikipedia assignments. So Wikipedia is openly licensed. Students can review a Wikipedia article for information gaps. They can just stop there. That's not quite you know, as far as you might want to go for open. They can do grammar edits. They can add citations. They can, um, well, this is our, our own UBC 
another level. They can actually practice doing Wikipedia style in the UBC Wiki where it's not yet public. I, actually, I'm sorry, it is public. It's not accessible to other people to edit. It's publicly available, though. Um, then you, they can create and edit their own Wikipedia article, or they could translate an article for a foreign language Wikipedia site. And all of these, not only are they creating knowledge that can be used by other people and revised by other people, they're also learning other skills like citation, finding reliable sources, writing for a larger audience, negotiating with the community around, you know, what should this article look like? And, you know, kind of dealing with people who disagree with you. So there's lots of things you can learn by doing this. Students in open textbooks, speaking of Robin DeRosa, who was here recently, um, she has two open textbook projects that involve students. Uh, she might actually have more by now, but this was her last blog post that I read. Um, the first one is this one, the Open Anthology of Earlier American Literature. There's, the students just got public domain books, or public domain works from English literature. And what they did is they collected them all into a textbook type format. And then students in the next iteration of the course wrote um, introductions, like biographical, historical details. They wrote study questions. Some of them could, uh, created videos or other multimedia. And they just stuck that all into the textbook. And that can keep going, right? The other open textbook project that she has, uh, students actually took some of her lectures and their notes about those and their notes on other works. Uh, and created their own narrative around a certain topic. Rather than taking texts that are public domain, they, they wrote all of it themselves. And then the next set of students can do the same thing in terms of adding more, editing, adding study questions, et cetera. So this is, this is a great way, I think, for students to take what's openly licensed or public domain, make something new that's gonna be usable by other students and, in fact, by the world, because this is publicly available. Um, my last example is something that I'm involved in at UBC, and this actually came about because of one of our students. It was uh, uh, Daniel Monroe, who was working with Jenna at the time and now is in Toronto, came up with this idea that we called open case studies. And what this is, is he wanted a way for students to be involved in creating open educational resources that would be used by other students and reused and continually uh, adapted. These are case studies that so far are just about sustainability, but actually we don't mind having any case studies in, in our repository, in our, our website. Uh, student and faculty written, depends on the course. Some of them are faculty written, some of them are student written. But in all cases, the students have been involved in some way in putting together the, the case study, whether writing it themselves, adding new material, um, or, or adding something at the end, a response, that kind of thing. And what we're hoping is that these case studies, as we build up, we have, well, we have a bunch, they're just not all in there yet. Uh, as we build up, that they can be used by other courses. And future students in those courses can then add new materials to the case studies or create new case studies. We have, we're happy to open this up to anybody. Um, I'm finding ways to, to make this available for people beyond UBC. So if anybody wants to get involved, um, please, there's my email address. No, it's not. My email address is coming up. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so please contact me. If you know of anybody who teaches with case studies who might want to get involved, that would be fantastic. So that's the end of my talk. <laughs> All right, uh, so last uh, to close us off here and to lead us into hopefully a little bit of a discussion. I'm gonna be fairly brief, I think, in my remarks. Um, I was just thinking as we were going through this, I just noticed and remembering that two years ago I was asked to be on the open access panel in this very same room where I, where I met. So, you know, and at that time, I decided to talk about open education. And now they invited me to come and be part of the OER panel on, for open education week, and I am going to make us talk about open access. And so, uh, so you know, if you have, we're both, you can just sort of just swap the talks. But uh, I want to talk a little bit some of the parallels between the two things. And, and I am more of an open access person than I am an OER person. I don't really consider myself an OER guy. Uh, whenever people associate me with OER kind of things, I always tend to try to defer them to someone else that is actually spends all of their time actually thinking and working in the open education space. Um, although I do do a lot of uh, sort of open pedagogy practices in my own classrooms, and I think by the 
um, you know, all of the open movements tend to sort of intermingle and mix, and all the people that support one tend to support the other, and we all join in in this big, happy, open, and welcoming family. Um, and so, but I, I want to talk and challenge a little bit some of that. One of the reasons that I accepted to being part of this panel, even though it was about uh, OERs, and OER, again, not, uh, it's not something I consider myself to be necessarily an expert in. Uh, part of it was the title. I love the, the phrase, the failure of access. Uh, and, and I love it for a couple of reasons. One, because it can be interpreted, if you just read just that piece and you don't read the rest of the description, it can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. And, and I love all of those interpretations, and they're all interpretations of something that I feel like I would come in and talk about, and we can, can rabble rouse a little bit around and challenge and critique a little bit some of the things that have gone on in the open movements. And, and I think that that kind of critique is, of the open movement is something that is uh, f like fundamentally and deeply necessary at this point, and that if we don't start to really turn a critical lens on what we are doing, we are going to continue to uh, take, uh, continue to advance openness, and at the end, we're going to get to a point where we're not happy with what that outcome is. And that's where I want to turn it to talk a little bit about what I see as some of the parallels with the open access movement, because in some sense, I feel like the open education movement is still in a moment where uh, there, it's gaining, I feel like, a, it's feels like it's gaining a lot of momentum. There are a lot of initiatives and organizations that are beginning to get support. There's more uh, uh, funding agencies that are supporting the OER movement. Uh, and it's really at a moment where it's feeling like a, a, a really a surge in the OER movement. In a way that I think the, in a place where, or, or in something similar to what the open access movement was like some years back. Uh, so open access movement is sort of celebrating its 15th year now of officially existing as a, as a thing that the Budapest Open Access Initiative and the Budapest Declaration, which is sort of the foundational moment of it as a movement, not as a practice, because open access has existed as a practice and people advocating it for a lot longer, but as a movement where it really tried to formalize itself and tried to build some support is now in its 15th year. Right? And so I'm part of a working group as part of the BOAI that is sort of was uh, collecting responses from people in the open access community around what the success look like, right? And what do, how do we measure the success of, of this movement? And when I was looking through the, all of the survey responses, and I was actually, one of my jobs as part of this working group was to look through the responses to, and you know, code up provide like a grounded theory approach of uh, you know, distilling what the answers were leading us to believe around uh, for, for this particular question, which is around what does success look like? And success was measured by most, like the majority of the people responding to this thing. You know, it wasn't a gigantic uh, response rate, a couple hundred people um, that responded. Uh, the majority of the people were talking about that we measure success by the percentage of OA papers that are out there published and there was, uh, or when we have 100% of the papers that are published being available, there was all these variants. People, some people say, well, when all of the papers future that published from today on are published in open access, other people said when all of, there was primarily measures around there is more open access in the world, right? So there are variants of that. Some people were more extreme in their views than others, but that was the measures of success. And, and I think that we as a movement have sort of gravitated, and, and I'm 100% guilty of this, so when, when I'm coming here to critique and challenge and to push you all to be critical of yourself, I, I'm including myself in, in having been guilty of, I think, doing this, which is of supporting everything that looks like it's somewhat loosely affiliated and supported. Oh, you look like a friend. Like, you, you've <laughs> talked, you came and you talked positively, and you talked about some of the positive things about openness. Whatever you're doing, I, it's welcome. It's part of helping us grow as a movement, right? You get someone that is doing a MOOC, they're like, oh, you're trying to make your uh, course content more accessible to the world. That's a positive thing. Welcome to the movement, right? <laughs> like, oh, you are publishing uh, some of the, you know, your, your, some accounts, your, some of your students' works are being put out publicly. Eh? That's uh, open, <laughs> reusable. Welcome to the movement, right? We welcome everyone because it's all about building towards this openness. And in the open access movement, what that's done, this push towards uh, welcoming all new kinds of people that are trying to do anything with openness, 
this measuring success only by what is more accessible, right? And so this is where I love the title, right? It's like this, this focus on access, and that's sort of the, out of the, men, the multiple interpretations of the failure of access, the one I uh, wanted to cling on to was this focus on the access piece. It's like you're doing something that's making something more open, right? And so that's something that we should welcome and embrace. And in the open access movement at the beginning, it was really thought about, this was the reason we're being so welcoming, is to build momentum and build a movement. And it was about being able to uh, correct all of the, it was a revolution to correct all of the wrongs with scholarly publishing. And so somebody, everyone in their mind would have this ideal picture by, of what the open world will look like, right? And so we started embracing everything that we felt was we're just building momentum so that we can get that ideal. We're going to fix that scholarly publishing world. In, this, in, in the similar way that I see in the open education movement, we think, well, we're going to start solving all of the access to education issues. We're going to start solving all of the accessibility issues. We're going to start solving all of the inequalities around access to education by just, we're just going to, we're doing something positive that's inching us towards a more open world. And since Whatever the ideal is of a world does have openness in it. We're feeling like we're building towards that, uh, that openness. But in the scholarly communication world, where we have seen how this has played out, right? we wanted uh, scholarly publishing to open access to solve the profiteering of commercial publishers. We wanted it to improve the, uh, the, uh, who was able to contribute to, uh, to knowledge production. We wanted it to speed up the way that we do science by allowing people to be recycling and reusing other people's work. And what we have, then we accepted. We accepted article processing charges as a mode, as a way of having open access. We accepted hybrid open access. We accepted both, we accept both green and, and gold, right? We accept both open access journals and repositories. We say all of those things are welcome because they're part of the open access movement. But what that's given us then as a result is that we have APCs that are excluding people from participating in, in knowledge production. We have enabled commercial publishers to build even stronger business models because we've said, yeah, that oh, those APCs, those hybrids, they're part of getting us to the movement. And so now they control more of the scholarly communication ecosystem than before in ways that then hinder the participation in scholarship, that hinder the actual reuse and, re, uh, and faster circulation of knowledge. Because we were trying to focus on saying, we'll just increase openness, and as a result of increasing openness, the world will be better. And it's not quite that simple. We need to think about what are the underlying causes of why we had that inequality in the first place, or why we had that lack of access in the first place, and think about how do we start addressing those. And if that means that uh, as every social movement is sort of guilty of this, at one point it's like everything is ill-defined and so you go broad. But then when you need to start working, you do need to start thinking about which are the steps along that road that are actually going to get us to what is the underlying cause of the, uh, of the problem and the underlying cause of the inequality or the injustice that we're trying to solve through openness. Um, um, it's, I, I, you know, I, I could continue on with my sort of, uh, sort of railing against the, this, this sort of idealistic approach of trying to do openness, um, but I'd rather stop there and open, leave that as a, as a place to open up a conversation about it. Um, it there, there's a lot of pragmatics at play in how, how do we, you know, resolve that. And so I guess it's, I'm not advocating that we now start excluding everyone and saying, like, no, you don't count. But, <laughs> But I do want us to turn a critical lens, and if there's one thing that's sort of to take away from, from this rambling is that I want us to, to start turning a critical lens on what we're doing and to start really thinking about what are the motivations and, and, and how do we actually move, steer the, the, all of this momentum and enthusiasm for open educational resources and open educational practices towards fundamental, like addressing those fundamental causes and those un fundamental uh, concerns that have given rise to this un unjust situation. Right. Thank you. Hello, hello. Okay, we're back on. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. 
Um, and thank you so much uh, for the keynote earlier. Uh, you guys have given me a lot of material to think over. You guys have addressed a lot of my questions, which is a little bit infuriating. And we have uh, six minutes. And we have six minutes to go. <laughs> Um, so in light of all of the presentations that we've heard today, uh, my first question for the panel uh, is a long one. Uh, so we've heard that the training for educators and openness needs to be both theoretical and practical. Uh, we've heard that open resources used need to be peer reviewed and the teaching and learning outcomes need to be backed up by research. Uh, we've heard that the resources themselves need to be adaptable for students with varying needs. They need to be offered in hundreds of languages and be available in different educational contexts. Um, and let's add on uh, what Juan just mentioned about the, in in sorry, the inequality and the injustices that currently exist. Where do we start? <laughs> I think we're out of time, Brady. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's up? <laughs> uh, I, was, I was on a roll with my rant now, you're going to put, uh, make me struggle a little bit more. Um, it's hard to, I mean, there isn't a natural, I don't think, starting point for how do we begin to, uh, how do we begin to do all of these things that we want openness to do, right? And, and this is, for me, that it's a little bit, that's part of what I think I'm rallying against here is, is a little bit the idea that openness is going to solve every problem. I think a lot of those problems don't have anything to do with, the, with, with OERs or with open educational resources. There is, it's part of we need to restructure, for example, or, or try to help reposition the role of the university in the public sphere. We need to start f f turning around the, what we consider to be the, uh, the focus on uh, serving the public as through the education of the students and through the students' engagement with the world. And so I think it's, we need to try to look at what are some of the values and how do we try to realign those values and focusing sometimes on the practice of you are doing this in an open way and you get to be an open cowboy, right? So that you get to be having a flag that you get to wave around, right? Saying that you're doing openness. Sometimes misses that uh, that there is like a, a larger problem at stake, which is that if we realign our values towards this serving the public in some way, some of those practices will follow from the values. And it's in trying to put the practice ahead of that, I, I think in some way, or using the practice to shift the values is a little problematic. So my answer is that, is that I don't think that we can, we can try to get openness in, in any of its forms to do all of those things. So it's a bit of a false question in my sense. I'm not, like, op open is important to me, but for me, I think the fundamental value is access. So coming back to some of the things that Robin DeRosa said, like, it, it's not, the open textbook movement doesn't excite me because it's about textbooks. It excites me because there's new opportunities for access. Access for different people, um, access for students with disabilities, like, that's what excites me. And I think there's a lot of different paths that we can take, and we have, like just looking in the room, there's so many different job descriptions and roles represented here, and I don't think there's a one simple answer, but talking to some of the librarians before this, um, and just thinking about my own library school education while Juan was ranting, like I think for librarians, we talk about open, but we don't actually practice it a lot, so I think 100% of the assignments in library school for me were disposable assignments. Um, we spend a lot of time creating subject guides that aren't open licensed, like, and citation guides. Like, I talked to someone who works at a college, and they just use that. They have their own college citation guide, but everyone just uses the SFU one because it's better. And then most people use the OWL one because, you know, that, that, that's a really good one. So why are we, <laughs> why are we spending all this time making... Even in, like with NBC, but nationally, like citing a journal article, is it that different in Quebec than it is here in BC? <laughs> and couldn't we collectively put our time together and make a giant thing and then just pull the ones that we want to use? Like, I think as librarians, we're, we're not actually doing open a lot. We're often in like the nice guy helper kind of position, but for our own work and our, our own output, we're not doing that. So to the librarians in this room, like, I think when you go back to work tomorrow, like, look for one place that you can crack something open a little wider, put your code on GitHub, license something. 
um, in an open way or when your stuff goes to publication, ask those questions. Like, I didn't know what green and gold access was. <laughs> I was like, what does that mean? Um, and then looking, and so I can speak from the UBC context, from the large research institution where those values are not there, where there exists, there's, it's true, where there exists those values in pockets, but, but at an institutional level isn't there, pragmatically, um, what we have to do is what um, we saw students doing um, last year and we see um, happening in pockets of, of practices changing that then move up to the value level. And where there are um, pieces, so you look at promotion and tenure is a great example, but if you look at the number of adoptions and the number of people talking about um, open and open access and open educational resources, that the, the change is not going to be made necessarily up here. It's going to be made at the practices that will be a collective to to change the values. And that culture change at our institution um, and at many other institutions happens very slowly. Um, and so it is more laborious maybe, but bringing more and more people on um, and, and cultivating those, those practices that, that are so valuable um, is the only way pragmatically that that change can be made. And it's, it'll take a long time. And through that, there'll be a lot of missteps, but, but really at, at some institutions, especially those that are so rigid in their culture, um, especially on, in the academic realm, um, the practices are really what is building up to policy rather than the other way. Um, and pragmatically, that's really the only way that we're going to get anywhere. Do you have anything else? I know we're out of time. But <laughs> so from, from a faculty perspective, I mean, the thing that there are a number of things that motivated me, but the things that I think might motivate others um, in terms of the kinds of, of assignments that I was talking about is people actually really care about teaching well. So one of the, the um, in, your, in your keynote, you were talking about the, the sustainability development goal four. Oh, excuse me. No, I'm sorry. It was the Paris OER to enhance the quality of teaching and learning. And I was like, well, there's so many ways that OER can do that. And one of them is get students involved in working on that. That actually enhances the quality of teaching and learning for them. So if we can kind of get that message across that okay, you could write another term paper, or you could do something kind of more interesting, and that would actually be good learning for your students, and that might help. At least it, it does me. <laughs> Recognizing that we're out of time, just one more hand for our panelists.